I'm particularly delighted to be introducing um, our first speaker this afternoon. Um, my work uh, here at Holy Cross in teaching and scholarship um, has really focused on children and family. So this is uh, in Catholic social teaching, and so this has been this is a remarkable uh, conference for me and. Um, I'm sure that most of us here today, or many of us here today, have either heard or used the words best kept secret in reference to Catholic social thought. We couldn't keep the heart of Catholic social teaching at Holy Cross a secret, even if we wanted to. <laughs> David O'Brien has been a renowned scholarly voice on behalf of workers and the poor, and is the author of numerous articles and book manuscripts too many, uh, and we want to maximize every moment of his time to speak to you. Um, but like many other scholars, I know that uh, Catholic Social Thought, the documentary Heritage, which he edited with Tom Shannon, is always on my shelf at the ready to help me in my teaching and scholarship. Please join me in welcoming to our podium Professor Emeritus, Loyola Professor of Roman Catholic Studies, and current University Professor, professor of Faith and Culture at the University of Dayton, David O'Brien. Thank you, Mary, very much. And thank you, Tom, for organizing this conference. And thanks to all of you for coming back so quickly from lunch. Um, I'm going to kind of abbreviate this paper a little bit, but I do have some copies, about 20 copies there. If you'd like a copy of the longer paper, you probably won't hear it all, although I do talk fairly fast. <laughs> um, uh, I, I wanted to welcome you, too, to Holy Cross, which uh, in 1971, about the time that Michael, no Michael Harrington came to speak at graduation, Time magazine called Holy Cross the cradle of the Catholic left. That made a few of us very happy, but it didn't last a long time. Um, I'm asked to speak about Catholic questions posed by Michael Harrington of the class of 47 and the other America, an assignment that makes me recall my friend and Harrington's most interesting Catholic socialist collaborator, the late John Court. He would have loved this conference and loved meeting all of you. What I would like to do, I'm going to skip my stories, but I have a couple of little stories I'll leave out, but you can read them in the paper. What I would like to do is speak briefly about three, um, three Harrington ideas as they relate to contemporary American Catholicism. Each can start with one of those wonderful bumper sticker phrases that cling to our memory of Michael Harrington. The first is, ideas have consequences. This was Harrington's shorthand for the impact of his Jesuit education at St. Louis, Louis University High School and Holy Cross. In his memoirs, he connected that phrase, ideas have consequences, with philosophy. I recall him, uh, him speaking here in Worcester, linking it as well to Jesuit teachers, some mentors, some far from it, who took their ideas with such seriousness that they pledged poverty, chastity, and obedience, dressed oddly, and devoted their lives full-time, 724, to not always deserving boys like himself. It seemed simple enough. If you believe something to be true, it ought to make a difference, a difference in your life and a difference in history. Here at Holy Cross, for some years, we pursued a renewal of liberal arts around the question, how then shall we live? Michael would have liked that, I think, but he would have asked about our answers and their consequences. Do our lives, including our intellectual and political lives, really bear witness to what we say really matters? The question would press even harder because of an amazing development in Catholic life and in Jesuit education after Harrington left Holy Cross. Around the time he became famous, the Catholic Church experienced the Second Vatican Council. When it ended in 1965, Catholics across the world explore, explored the consequences of new ideas coming from the Council. In 1968, the bishops of Latin America pledged to make a preferential option for the poor, an idea whose consequences brought explosions of creative pastoral and political theology and practice in South and Central America. In 1974, the Jesuits made their own commitment to consider all their ministries in the context of that option for the poor. Two years later, their beloved general, Pedro Arupe, said that the goal of Jesuit, Jesuit education should become the formation of, quote, men for others, close quote, Christians who would live out the consequences of their faith by working for a more just and peaceful world. Students picked up that phrase, now men and women for others, and often used it proudly as shorthand for the distinctiveness of Jesuit education. The Jesuit commitment to faith and justice and the option for the poor has remained solid continually reaffirmed by Jesuit authorities, 
often in very challenging terms, and incorporated into high school and college mission statements. The Harrington notion that ideas have consequences uh, is evident on Jesuit campuses. Flourishing programs of community service, service learning, and increasingly more sophisticated community-based learning. Domestic and international immersion programs for students, and in a few striking cases for faculty and administrators. Creative economic and community development partnerships with neighborhood civic groups and local governments, and sincere efforts to balance the financial aid needs of low-income students and the need to keep student loans burdens reasonable with the ever-increasing desire of middle and upper-income families for attractive facilities and labor-intensive academic programs that open to good jobs and top-rated graduate and professional schools. What would Harrington think about all this? I suspect he would respect the work of Jesuits and lay leaders to combine academic excellence, civic responsibility, and attentiveness to the poor. And he would be inspired by the many students whose lives are transformed by encounters with poverty, encounters very much like the one he claims to have had in a St. Louis housing project in the summer of 1949. Most of all, he would welcome any chance to join what our Holy Cross mission statement calls, quote, conversation about fundamental human questions, close quote, of meaning and mutual obligation, our words for the Jesuit motto of faith and justice. Harrington's biographer confirms what his memoirs reveal and his friends remember. Conversation was probably the most enduring of Michael Harrington's vocational commitments. Still, I think he would want to push the ideas have consequences envelope for students, but even more for trustees and administrators, faculty, and staff. Is the option for the poor evident in our life and work, in our scholarship and teaching, in college policies and campus culture? As Latin American theologians have taught, the option has intellectual and political consequences, drawing those who make the option to the politics of knowledge and to a more intellectually serious and personally risky politics. And then there is that word conversation, which may be the number one word in contemporary Jesuit educational discourse. It allows for inclusion and invites diversity. It requires open windows and resists exclusion and arbitrary authority. But does it also encourage or even respect commitment, the kind of commitment required by any serious option for the poor? In fact, our Jesuit and Catholic option for the poor has a lot in common with the spirit of the other America. The book is solidly within the American muckraker tradition, forcing the reader to face previously invisible and sordid realities, trusting that once facing the facts of oppression and injustice, Americans will demand change and find ways to bring it about. So too, we in Jesuit and Catholic circles encourage exposure to injustice, invite theological and ethical reflection, offer courses that sharpen analysis of causes and consequences, and some that don't, and hope that students, graduates, readers of our work, and others will find their own way to do something. Politics, including the politics of knowledge, most especially our own politics, is rarely on the agenda. I would give a couple of examples, but I'll go through them quickly for the sake of time. One is um, <clears throat> Catholic higher education leaders, especially Jesuit leaders, helped to bring about the formation of Campus Compact, the nation's national network of college and university presidents committed to uh, co uh, community and public service. Uh, at a certain point in their history, the presidents tolerated but didn't actively support a move of Campus Compact to really move into more political and critical kind of engagement with the issues that arise through service under the motto from service to citizenship. Many presidents indeed signed off with that group's effort of, to ha have uh, um, statements about civic engagement. But when that moment passed and Campus Compact let up a little bit on the idea of public work and civic engagement and political analysis and judgment, uh, there was no leadership from the Catholic College and University presidents to sustain that movement of uh, community service into civic engagement and serious consideration of citizenship. Similarly, a lot of colleges and universities, including many Catholic colleges and universities, received large $2 million grants from the Lilly Endowment a few years ago for programs that would encourage consideration of vocation. Now, if you really are serious about vocation, then you would really want to examine three things. One, the context, the political, cultural, and economic context of human work. Secondly, would be the formation of communities of mutual support to sustain the kind of values and faith that may give rise to a sense of vocation and calling. And third, 
civic organizations and political options appropriate to the kinds of, uh, kinds of justice and uh, uh, option for the poor needs that people might have. As far as I can judge, none of the programs did any of that. Huh? That is to say, they offered consideration of vocation, they encouraged people to think about vocation, but they did not, and still do not, seriously take up the availability or lack of availability of organizational options that would be able to sustain commitments people would make on campus. The fact is that most would say we are not responsible for that. Thus, the politics of knowledge and politics generally are not on the table. Still, the story is not yet over, and Harrington-like ideas abound in Jesuit and Catholic intellectual life. As long as they do, the challenge of their consequences will be a resource for further efforts to implement the option for the poor and the service of faith that does justice. That's part one. Part two, the second Harrington phrase, the left wing of the possible. This was Harrington's strategic resolution of the dilemma of democratic socialism, which Daniel Bell famously described as trying to act politically while in but not of the world. Harrington spoke of visionary gradualism. He affirmed the democratic socialist vision, one version of the beloved community, while at the same time he insisted on sharing responsibility for the immediate demands of public life in alliance with the Democratic Party and trade unions. He practiced as best he could both a politics of ultimate ends and a politics of responsibility to use Max Weber's formulation. As we have read and heard, Harrington was both an idealist, loving America and its people, believing in the possibilities of global solidarity, and a realist, impatient with reckless rhetoric and symbolic gestures, even more with the postures so common now in Catholic politics as substitutes for effective action. That position on the left wing of the possible has not worked out well. As labor allies, especially have lost ground, feminist and civil rights movements have passed, and the politically possible has shifted very far to the right. Democratic, much less social democratic options are more or less unavailable, at least in the United States. Among Catholics, the same is true. The center, occupied by the bishops who wrote the remarkable pastoral letters on peace and the economy in the 1980s, that kind of position is now defined as the left, while what Time Magazine called the Catholic left is off the charts. This did not just happen, of course. <clears throat> like the mumbling of God we'll talk about in a minute and consequent uh, religious unraveling, the narrowness of political possibilities has something to do with the widespread avoidance or denial of responsibility by institutions and many of us. Yet I think a case can be made that something like the left wing of the possible is a good place for Catholics to address the consequences of their religious ideas. In fact, if we had time, I think I could make a case that the left wing of the possible is precisely the location of developing Catholic thought on peace, though that subject no longer seems to interest most Catholics. Those developments refuse to surrender the call to nonviolence, nor the need to build cultures of peace through a politics of peace. They turn peace into a verb. Comparable struggles to combine the radical requirements of faith and the ambiguous demands of politics and citizenship might do the same for social justice. At one time, in the combination of faith-based community organizing, intelligent participation in dialogue about the moral dimensions of public policy, and the faith and justice research and teaching we hoped for above, some of us thought we were doing that right on the edge of the possible. If Catholic liberals, Harrington's one-time Catholic moderate fellow travelers, are now on the defensive, if the Vatican II approach we adopted has lost ground, it may be because we did not find ways to connect it to the pastoral life of the church, and that is to the aspirations of the Catholic people. Here, I think, is another point that needs emphasis, one caught well by Morris Isserman at the end of his recent dissent article. When Harrington wrote The Other America, uh, he was writing to and speaking for a community of conscience. Like almost all socialists, he believed that the self-interest of oppressed classes could only be met by social and economic transformation. A large part of socialist work was overcoming the false consciousness of the oppressed, convincing them that socialist policies provided the best way to secure their interests. Those who worked to do the convincing were socialists by conviction, leaders of the constituency of educated men and women whom he tried to attract in all those books, newsletters, lectures, meetings, and late night conversations. Like the option for the poor, democratic socialism was a voluntary commitment of free men and women. The justice question, then and now, is asked of us. I'll skip a little more about that constituency of conscience. 
This recently expanded. There is the, the, there's a whole way of looking at American Catholic history. Most people who think seriously about Catholic history these days, our historical location, think that American Catholics, because they wanted to make it, they wanted material success, they wanted social acceptance, they wanted to be at the heart of things, kind of uh, in that aspiration to up, rise up the social and economic ladder, left their Catholic faith behind. And now they've lost their way, their identity, maybe even their integrity. And the only way they can recover a sense of vitality in the church is to recover a sense of their distance from an American culture and their distance from their fellow Americans. Michael Harrington would tell his Catholic friends, I think, that that's a formula for really terrible politics. He once said uh, in, in Assumption, when he was speaking in Assumption, he said, we should be really glad that some people, uh, religious people, get involved in politics. What we should worry about is religious people who get involved in really terrible politics. And that understanding, which is universal, opus Dei, Catholic worker, left to right, all have that sense that the church has lost its way because it's too much into the heart of American culture and needs to find a way of adopting a more countercultural kind of stance. And I think and everything about Michael Harrington's politics would say that's a formula for really bad and irrelevant and un unhelpful politics. The other way of looking at our history, which can be illustrated in his own family history as well, is a story of liberation, of, hard, of immigrant working class people who worked hard in order to have their kids be able to go to college, rise up the social and economic ladder, and have the opportunity to go to places like Holy Cross and ask the question, how then shall we live, without laughing, huh? that in fact you could make choices. The future was really in your hands. That's a story of ambiguous but real uh, human liberation. And the question for the liberation is liberation brings about a full share of responsibility for the world in which we live. And I think that's where Michael Harrington was trying to speak to us and to speak to all of us and in our case, Catholics. This Catholic community of conscience is still trying to work out the meaning of its journey, searching perhaps for an alternative to subcultural restoration. Harrington and the other America simply set forth a challenge and did not offer socialist analysis and solutions. It was an act of trust in the reader and in the American people. From then on, after that, he insisted on presenting the socialist project. He remained an evangelist, trying to persuade free men and women to decide for themselves to commit to democracy, which he believed would then require the commitment to democratic socialism. Unlike almost all figures on the, on the American left, with the exception of Eugene Debs and Martin Luther King, Harrington knew that the only good political future is one people choose for themselves. Catholic social thought and action need to take that kind of constructive democratic turn. To really dig into the life of our church and our people, we need to avoid trivializing the challenge of poverty by confining our response to voluntary community service, nonpartisan political moralizing, or guilt-ridden denunciation of somebody else's social sins. Instead, we need to really think about how to persuade each other that the common good, as understood in Catholic social teaching, in a religiously diverse world is a genuine good, a good worthy of our complete dedication. It is also an imperative amid the, what Harrington called the inexorable socialization of the entire planet. We will change the world through economic and political action or we will not change the world. Good work is always God's work. Conscientious citizenship is in fact discipleship. The third uh, Harrington phrase is mum God's mumbling. Michael Harrington used this image in answering a question from his much beloved cousin Peggy, who said, if you die and go over and find God, what are you going to do? And at, Holy Cross, at uh, Assumption, he said, if I die and go over and meet God, I'll say, why did you mumble? <clears throat> Harrington's religious story is familiar. Raised deep within the American Catholic subculture, he was an exemplary Catholic boy until he left Holy Cross. At Yale, <laughs> at Yale in Chicago, he read himself out of the church, then came back in via the Catholic worker in Dorothy Day. Then, after too many nights in Greenwich Village, he left never to return. His classmates and many admirers were less sure that he was out, but he was convinced, so by no means was he done with God questions. He remained, as Gary Dorian's phrase, religiously musical. He welcomed Catholic allies like John Court and Rosemary Ruther, but he called himself, quote, a pious apostate, an atheist shocked by the faithful, faithlessness of believers, a fellow traveler of moderate Catholics. There was a personal side to that that's recounted in his memoirs, and there was a political side that's explored in depth in the politics of God's funeral. Uh, <clears throat> 
God was dead in large parts of the Christian world, and in the emerging global community, religions were too diverse and internally conflicted, and life too functionally differentiated and specialized for religion any longer to offer an integrating consciousness. So where was one to go to find a basis for solidarity, human rights, and the common good? He thought the democratic socialist movement might bring believers and non-believers together to fulfill that function. But he was aware, as anyone, of the dangers of nationalism and political idolatry, and he warned against turning socialism into a substitute for religion. Like many contemporary participants in interfaith dialogue, I think of Hans Kung and Paul Nitter, he hoped for a kind of civil religion, a religion of humanity that would give meaning to history and provide resources for constructing new social institutions. Catholics who think that way get in trouble, but I wonder if Harrington wasn't onto something when he made that argument in the politics of God's funeral. When he spoke about the Vietnam War at our Holy Cross commencement in 1971, the student valedictory speaker that day, to Harrington's shock and surprise, said that most members of the class were no longer Orthodox Catholics, although most hoped to remain Catholic, quote, in some way, close quote. <clears throat> Harrington wrote a column about that a few weeks later, and he said that if he had said that in his 1947 graduation address, the Jesuits would have pitched him bodily off the stage. In his memoirs, he said his classmates would have done the pitching. Um, the student speaker, however, was maybe more prophetic than he could have imagined. We have recently learned that former Catholics are now the second largest religious group in the country, and that a sizable portion, perhaps a third of younger Americans, acknowledge no religion at all, what they call now the new nuns and all of this. Here it gets quite personal, doesn't it? As most Catholics in my generation worry that our children are at some distance from the church and our grandchildren receive little in the way of intelligent religious formation. Yet after decades of talks in church basements, I know that most of us admire our children and their families as we admire our graduates, so many of whom also testify to their struggles with the church and with the faith. This is especially true of women and other of those huge ideas have consequences challenges. Many of us, I suspect, have made the same plea that some of Mike's classmates made to him that they were not as far out as they think. Nevertheless, God, or at least the Catholic God we have known, seems to be, to be at best mumbling these days. And so are we, perhaps. Teresa of Avila once said that God has no hands but ours and maybe no voice but ours. The polls suggest continuing interest in spiritual matters, even hungers for the transcendent, but deep reservations about organized religion. Among those reservations are concerns about politics, including the politics of culture. And in the case, Catholic case, those concerns cannot be passed off as somebody else's problem. Here, too, ideas have consequences, and the consequence of Catholic ideas require acceptance of shared responsibility inside as well as outside the church. So we might reread Harrington on religion because his journey may not be that much different from some of our contemporaries and maybe even some of our own family, friends, and students. Have they fallen away or fallen forward? Have they left behind one faith in search of a larger one? Are we dis despair of an unchurched citizenry, a specter that seems to haunt many Christian conservatives, including some political candidates? Then what are we to do with Abraham Lincoln and Jade Adams, or with people like Worcester Icon and non-denominational Christian Abby Kelly Foster, who could recite entire books of the Bible, then preach on each for hours, but did not uh, belong to any particular church? or her husband, abolitionist Stephen Foster, who loved Jesus but offered a book entitled The Brotherhood of Thieves, The American Church and Its Clergy. <laughs> Perhaps the question is not how do we get Catholics back to church, but how do we accompany them as they enter ever more fully into American and global life? That is what our church did during earlier risk-filled historical transitions and still does in many places today accompanying immigrants as they moved to America and, and accompanying their descendants as they moved out of old neighborhoods and up social and economic ladders. Today, accompaniment might require us to rethink once again the consequences of our faith, to see if we can help God speak more clearly and get over the mumbles. Maybe Harrington helps. Ted Kennedy said at a tribute held for Harrington shortly before his death, quote, I see Michael Harrington delivering the Sermon on the Mount to America. Ever an optimist, Harrington hoped that the decline of religion as measured by church attendance and religious doctrine, quote, might actually signal a deepening of religion. Personal faith and what he called moral solidarity might fill the space left behind by the decline of religion amid moral decay, social emptiness, and homelessness, close quote. He always hoped to turn anxieties into opportunities for human emancipation and social justice. 
Don't many of our faith-filled students hope to help with that? But it won't just happen, quote, again from Harrington, the left cannot content itself to sit around waiting for some catastrophe to save it from its own political impotence. The next left, he said, understands itself as a movement of genuine moral vision, and it should begin now to assemble the forces and develop the ideas for a new America in a new world, close quote. My friends will not be surprised that I'm going to end by claiming Harrington is an Americanist. Some people call me the last Catholic Americanist. Theologian John Coleman said years ago that the Vatican II approach to religion and politics would only work if we truly loved our country. Our inability to handle that challenge may account for our so far losing performance in the Catholic culture wars. On that scale, Harrington never failed. It was as a socialist and because I was a socialist that I fell in love with America, he wrote. To be a socialist is to make an act of faith, of love even, toward this land. It is to sense the seed beneath the snow to see beneath the veneer of corruption and meanness and the commercialization of human relationships, men and women capable of controlling their own destinies, close quote. Later, he told his friends, quote, if you consider your country capable of democratic socialism, you must do two things. First, you must deeply love and trust your country. You must sense the dignity and humanity of the people who survive and grow within your country despite the injustice of its system. And secondly, you must recognize that the social vision to which you are committing yourself will never be fulfilled in your lifetime." Close quote. Morris Isserman says that we can read the other America as, quote, Michael Harrington's love letter to the United States, a country he believed in enough to want to see it change for the better, close quote. In the other America and, and in his 1971 Holy Cross commencement address, Harrington quoted Auden's, we must love one another or die. And he told the graduates in 1971, at a time of political turmoil, that together they needed to turn that poetic insight into what he called a practical principle of our daily life. Love for the world and its people may carry good Catholic men and women a long way from the church, especially if, through believers, God mumbles. But if, they love tr if we love truthfulness and justice, and the people with whom we live, as Harrington did, and turn that love into constructive and visionary politics, then it may well be that we can together make what Harrington called the history of a future. Close, uh, and so that's the end. Thank you. I think we have five minutes left if anybody has any questions. Michael Kazin, Georgetown. Hi, Hi. Michael. Um, yeah, if you could expand a little bit about your comments about the, uh, well, it's not the missing Catholic left, of course, but uh, the decline uh, of the Catholic left. Um, uh, give us a, I know you've written about this, but give us a, uh, uh, a, a quick analysis, if you would, um, because obviously there's people out there you know, doing labor stuff. Uh, uh, John Sweeney you know, used to say that, that Catholic social doctrine was, uh, was crucial to, to his thinking, uh, but of course he's retired now. But, um, so I just, you know, if you could expand on, on some of the comments you made uh, eloquently, uh, but a little bit tangentially perhaps. We took a few things for granted, I guess. Um, John Sweeney used to talk about the combination of the trade union, the parish church and Democratic Party, right? They were all constitutive elements of kind of a culture that was empowering for people, and we haven't really had a good book on that or a good theological political reflection on that long history of that kind of bottom-up mobilization that was so responsible for, quote unquote, the success of Catholics in the United States. And as those, as that phenomenon changed demographically, you can still find comparable uh, activities taking place, especially in Latino uh, churches in the Southwest, where you'll find community organizing now in the place of what trade union used to be, strong parish organizations in some places, and a lot of advocacy on the part of the bishops for the needs of Latinos and immigrants and that sort of thing. So there are some, count there are some counterparts to that among some of the newer churches in the, in the country. But um, in general, I don't think we, we on the Catholic left had a very good strategy for getting uh, through the kind of changes that we've confronted in the past. And I do, me I do think a couple of things that have to do with that. One is um, the lack of a pastoral strategy as part of our political and social organizing and writing. Huh? Monsignor Jack Egan from Chicago used to say, if you let social and pastoral ministry get separated, 
then you're going to lose, right? They've got to stay somehow in close connection with each other. And I think we did let them get separated, and social ministry became more and more professionalized, and uh, the pastoral ministry came more and more distanced from the social life and social teaching of the church. So we didn't have a strong pastoral component. Secondly, we didn't build on the... We didn't build on the initiatives out of Chicago Catholicism to really come up with a th theology and pastoral practice appropriate to the needs of educated, middle-class, Americanized lay Catholics. Huh? Andrew Greeley and others kept pushing us in that direction, but for a variety of reasons, perhaps because we thought of the left as being with the poor and with the working class and so on, we didn't take seriously uh, the need to come up with a positive and constructive pastoral strategy for middle-class Americans. So that when on our campuses, when we have now for how many years, wonderful cadres of inspired students, where do they go when they leave the campus? They seem to gradually kind of disappear into the fabric. We didn't think through the need to provide both pastoral and kind of socio-political opportunities for them to continue the kind of work that they did when they get out there. So I had in one part of the paper uh, both the pastoral problem, where do they go out there in the church, and we didn't attend to the pastoral needs. And secondly, I think the uh, failure to come up with work-centered uh, social and cultural institutions, for example, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Union of Concerned Scientists, those kinds of organizations which we in Catholic higher education should have been promoting, encouraging, and trying to bring about the development of so people could have a way to express an ethical and political voice within uh, the workplace and within professional and business organizations. So there's some signs of improvement in that, I think, in some of the campuses, but it's been a real struggle. So we never found a way to mobilize the Catholic middle class. And the data, scary stuff of the data, is now we're losing them, <laughs> uh, that they would now say they're new nuns. That's in part because Catholic adults, grown-ups, especially in academic life, basically took no responsibility for the sexual abuse crisis and a deep corruption in the American church and simply left it to the bishops. And as such, I think we're paying a huge cost in people walking away from it. We didn't care enough to fight to save the church from and guide the church through that scandal. So now we're, vi we're wit witnessing a pastoral unraveling of the American church, especially in our big urban areas. I don't know if that helps, but it's kind of a pessimistic view. But. There's a group called Voice of the Faithful that was an effort to mobilize lay people. And uh, middle class, educated lay Catholics would pat you on the back and say, it's really good you're doing that. But they wouldn't send you a check and they wouldn't join. Same thing in 2004, Catholics and Alliance for the Common Good tried to offer a fuller understanding of Catholic social teaching in the political arena when the Catholic uh, position was hijacked by very well-organized religious right. And almost nobody uh, other than some really heroic, wonderful young people got involved in those organizations or sending checks or joined. So basically, opportunities were provided and people, for the most part, didn't do anything. So just like Harrington said, you're not going to change America if you don't love it. You're not going to change the church if you don't love it either. Yeah. Uh, Peter Bruce, uh, uh, follow-up question on that. Uh, I remember in the 1990s, there was the Catholic bishop's letter on the economy. Both exactly, in 1986. The US, yeah. uh, a social democratic uh, letter, I thought, and uh, quite radical William F. Buckley was really incensed about it. And uh, today, I wonder where is... Uh, the voice, uh, you know, yeah. like that, that might challenge yeah. somehow the ideology of laissez-faire, yeah. which seems to dominate. Both when parties. I said that stuff about the shift of the Catholic Center, those pastoral letters and the economic letter was 1986. We had its 25th anniversary last year. Um, both of those letters featured widespread consultation with the church around the country, significant efforts by the bishops themselves to listen to voices from many different uh, communities and sectors in the society and to come up with a kind of moral uh, vision and a kind of moral commentary that really did try to contribute to a wider public dialogue about the ethics of war and peace in the one case and the economy in the others. Um, basically, that we call that the Bernardine kind of project, Cardinal Bernardine of Chicago, which uh, the, the one, one bishop, a well-known left-wing bishop, said every time you saw Bernardine go to the microphone, you said, here comes old down-the-middle Joe. Now, he was the center. And when he was the center, we could be the left. Well, Bernardine, in the last years of his life, proposed something called the, the Common Ground Initiative to try to hold the church together and open up kind of public conversation about controversial issues. And his fellow cardinals basically said, we're not going to do that. We don't have to do that. 
Rome and the Vatican provide. So that made <laughs> Bernardine the left, see? That's what I meant about shifting to the left. The center now became quite different. Among the things at the center was the sharp cutback in the staff, budget, and allowed parameters of the National Bishops' Conference, a project that went on right out in the open, that was actively promoted by Catholic conservatives, and that drew almost no opposition from so-called progressive Catholics who thought they didn't need the National Bishops' Hierarchy or the National uh, Organization. So now the, the, the parameters of what the National Conference can do have narrowed, uh, but what they do do is not based on consultation or uh, widespread consultation like those letters, but on their own judgment with some advisors behind closed doors. So it's uh, very, very harmful. Right now, I, I really feel the contraception thing is, forget about contraception, it has to do, this is gonna destroy Catholic health care, uh, Catholic social services, and probably fourth Catholic higher education to uh, drop its Catholic affiliation. That's where it'll end up. Anyway, thank you. So, thank you very much.